Hi, welcome back. In this video, we are going to talk about Nikki. Nikki, Nikki, Nikki. Throughout recorded time, and probably since the end of the Neolithic age, there have been three kinds of people in the world. The high, the middle, and the low. They have been subdivided in many ways. They have borne countless different names and their relative numbers as well as their attitude towards one another have varied from age to age. But the essential structure of society has never altered. Even after enormous upheavals and seemingly irrevocable changes, the same pattern has always asserted itself. The aim of these three groups are entirely irreconcilable. The aim of the high is to remain where they are. The aim of the middle is to change places with the high. And the aim of the low, when they have a name, is to abolish all distinctions and create a society in which all men shall be equal. Thus, throughout history, a struggle which is the same in its outlines occurs over and over again. No more are these themes accentuated than in South Africa. Political unrest, looting, load shedding, rising unemployment rates, and the most contentious of them all, inequality. How come only a handful of individuals have all the power? How come only one individual controls 30% of the entire world's diamond supply? Hi, welcome to Dollar Bill's Corner, and in this video, we delve deep into how one man controlled the largest diamond company in the world. Since its inception in 1888, De Beers, founded by businessman Cecil Rhodes, has grown into the largest diamond producer on the planet. The name De Beers originates from two Dutch settlers, Diederik and Nicolas De Beers. These two brothers owned a farm that was later discovered to have diamonds underneath. The British government forced them to sell this farm to Alfred Ebden for £6,600, which amounts to £723,360 adjusted for inflation today. For perspective, that's a measly 17 million rand for a piece of land that could be worth billions. Cecil Rhodes got his start renting water pipes to miners during the diamond rush of 1869. However, as a shrewd businessman, he understood that he wasn't going to become a millionaire by leasing out water pipes. So he used his profits to expand his business into the mining industry by purchasing small mining claims wherever he could. A claim is a piece of land allotted or taken by someone in order to be mined. He quickly consolidated all his mining operations into a separate company. However, to him, this was not quick enough. So he decided to approach one of the most powerful family elites in the world, the Rothschilds, to finance his corporate expansion. Through the sheer force of mergers and acquisitions, aka business takeovers, Cecil asserted his dominance in the mining industry. In the meantime, a competitor by the name of Barney Barnato increased his power and influence within the same industry and it didn't take long before the two would butt heads. Life is a competition after all. Don't be deceived. In the book, The 33 Strategies of War, Robert Greene writes, Life is endless battle and conflict, and you cannot fight effectively unless you can identify your enemies. People are subtle and evasive, disguising their intentions, pretending to be on your side. You need clarity. Learn to smoke out your enemies, to spot them by the signs and patterns that reveal hostility. Then, once you have them in your sights, inwardly declare war. Do not be naive. With some enemies, there can be no compromise. No middle ground. So blow for blow, attack after attack, in efforts to outproduce each other they flood the market with diamonds and as a result the prices of diamonds went into a free fall. Greek mythology teaches us the story of King Pyrrhus. In 279 BC during the Battle of Ascalon comes the expression Pyrrhic victory, signifying a win that is as good as a defeat for it came at a great loss. Cecil and Barney realized that unless they joined forces they'd either both die in the ring or the victor would be so badly injured after the fight that it wasn't even worth it, making this a pyrrhic victory. In order to avoid this, in 1888, they merged, establishing De Beers Consolidated Mines Limited. In 1902, Cecil Rhodes passes away and a mysterious figure is appointed as a local agent for the powerful London syndicate. As he rises in prominence, he is appointed as the mayor of Kimberley. And in 1917, Johannesburg, South Africa, at the tender age of 37, after building up a war chest of money, networks and influence, he founds Anglo-American. His name? Ernest Oppenheimer.
Anglo-American was primarily a gold mining company. However, as part of its expansion strategy, it intended to diversify its mining operations. Ernest, therefore, seek to seize the opportunities presented to him in the diamond industry, so he bought a seat on the board of De Beers Consolidated Mines Limited. In addition to his own personal stake in De Beers through Anglo-American, Ernest strategically built a strong position in De Beers Consolidated Mines Limited. They bought so many shares, in fact, that by 1926, Anglo-American officially became the largest shareholder of De Beers. Oppenheimer, with such a huge vested interest in De Beers, was now in a good position to wrest control of the late Cecil Rhodes De Beers company and forge his own new global empire. Three years after getting a seat on the board, Ernest Oppenheimer was appointed as chairman of the board. With his newfound power, Ernest was able to convince the board to move his stepchild De Beers into a new headquarter, where he would share the same roof as his firstborn, Anglo-American. By bringing these two companies under one roof, like a true alpha, he was able to rule with an iron fist and establish a proper monopoly. If you're a founder or entrepreneur, what you want to aim for is monopoly. You want to aim to build a company that is one of a kind uh, and that it's so far um, differentiated from the competition that it's not even competing. Before his father, Harry Oppenheimer, left the reins to his more ambitious son, Nicky, an Oxford man, was pursuing a master's degree in philosophy, politics, and economics. After graduating from Oxford while still in England, Nicky went to work for his grandfather's company, the Anglo-American Corporation, in London. On paper, he was the personal assistant to his father, but behind the scenes, he was being groomed to one day take over the Oppenheimer empire. During his time here, he was 23 at the time, he learned the business inside out, and seven long years after first joining Anglo-American, Nicky came back home, to his place of birth, Johannesburg, Mzansi, South Africa. It was 1975 at the time, and tensions between the apartheid government and the African race was growing rapidly, with Nelson Mandela locked away behind bars. Focused on his ascent to glory, at the age of 33, Nicky was appointed as a director of De Beers Group, and it didn't take long before he was appointed as chairman of De Beers, becoming the third Oppenheimer to do so. This power came with tremendous responsibility, as heading the beers came with an onslaught of new challenges due to their declining position as a monopoly in the diamond industry. To strengthen the beers' position against Australia's and Russia's arrival in the diamond market, Nikki expanded the beers into the retail industry and even partnered with heavyweights like LVMH, the largest luxury conglomerate in the world. Under his leadership, the beers went on to accomplish lofty feats such as the discovery of the Millennium Star Diamond the launch of De Beers Diamond Jewelers, opening their first mine outside Africa, and launching Forevermark. As we all know, diamonds are forever. However, all good things come to an end. And the Oppenheimer control came to an end in 2011, when Nicky Oppenheimer sold the family's remaining stake in De Beers to Anglo-America. Thus, in 2012, De Beers consolidated into Anglo-America, while Nicky retired to focus on his philanthropic endeavors instead. Today. Nicky Oppenheimer is worth a cool $8.4 billion, making him the third richest man in Africa. Now, I will not pretend that these riches and exorbitant fortunes of wealth were not built on the backs of exploited black people. Trust me. I pride myself in probably being one of the most anti-woke black people in the world. However, during the writing of this chapter, I was reminded of a passage in Nelson Mandela's autobiography Long Walk to Freedom, in which he describes conditions in the mind succinctly as follows. Miners had a mystique. To be a miner meant to be strong and daring, the ideal of manhood. Much later, I realized that it was the exaggerated tales that caused so many young men to run away to work in the mines of Johannesburg, where they often lost their health and often their lives. In those days, working in the mines was almost as much of a rite of passage as circumcision school, a myth that helped the mine owners more than it helped my people. It was these kind of melancholic scenes that resonated with a part of me that is somewhat woke or pro-black. Tata Madiba himself, a former miner, further described life as a mine worker as being brutal, underpaid and exhausting. In this autobiography, I learned that the costs of mining were so high that the only way that these mines could make a profit was by exploiting black people. In my videos, I do not wish to discredit the people I document, neither do I want to express ill-informed, baseless accusations of how this person oppressed this person or took advantage of that person. However, Exalni, 
at Ghani neglect the fact that my people were killed, exploited, and taken advantage of as part of the reason as to why some of the individuals I cover became successful. In the absence of the technological advancements we have today, black people were forced to work long hours in these mines for little pay and often to the detriment of their own health. While in the meantime, the Cecil Rhodes, the Barnatos, the Oppenheimers would work in fancy air-conditioned offices paid for by the black man's hard labor. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the Beers and Anglo-America had a huge role impoverishing my people for their own financial greed to become the companies they are today. However, the Jews too were brutally taken advantage of and exploited less than a hundred years ago during the Holocaust. Yet today, they are one of the most powerful and financially successful races on this planet. This gives me hope. If they were able to accomplish some of the things that they were able to accomplish, then we can too. I think it's time that we stopped blaming, we stopped complaining, we stopped pointing fingers, and we try to take the future into our own hands. And I do not mean to sound insensitive, but every race was exploited at some point in history. Yet there's only one that still complains about it. It's about time that we stopped. With Bruce Cleaver at the helm of the Beers and Duncan Wanblad appointed as the new CEO of Anglo-American, it is doubtful that Jonathan Oppenheimer, Nikki's heir, like his father, grandfather and great-grandfather before that, will continue the family tradition and reign supreme in Anglo-American and De Beers. It is a well-known fact that family fortunes typically disintegrate every three generations. The reason being that wealth is a finite resource and due to the lack of financial literacy that is passed down from generation to generation, without proper knowledge of money management, investments, taxes and accounting, families tend to deplete their own wealth over time. I mean, they weren't there during the struggles of creating it. So how would they develop the necessary acumen to maintain it? Umuzolo. So despite the fortunes they already have, it may well be that the Oppenheimers are approaching the end of an era. Today, we have amongst us more ambitious, more hungry, more motivated individuals than that of the privileged Oppenheimer's descendants. I can only hope that the next Oppenheimer's will be Gumete, Kwabe, Nguni, Kayeyeye, Konjo, Usiljabashezi, Bagapagatwayo, Abatibeja, Bebebeyenga, Umuntu, Ngendaba, Beti, Luyeya, Ngendana, Umalokozano, Beiteka, Ikuni, Sitingita, Yoyotaba. Hi! To those of us buying land, Establishing monopolies and creating generational wealth. To us, I say, greatness is coming. Peace.